Hello, everyone, and welcome to Know Your Dunes, an educational community webinar hosted by the Humboldt Coastal Dunes Cooperative. My name is Susie Fortner, and I am the Programs and Operations Director with Friends of the Dunes. I will also be your host this evening. I would like to start by acknowledging that the coastal dune environments that the Humboldt Dunes Cooperative is working to conserve are located in the ancestral unceded territory of the Wiat people, which includes the Wiat tribe, Bear River Rancheria, and Blue Lake Rancheria. Wiat people continue to be stewards of these coastal environments surrounding Wigi, the Humboldt Bay, as they have been since time immemorial. One of the ways in which we can honor our placement within Wiat territory is by recognizing the original names of these places, as well as the native plants and animals of these places in Sulatulak, the Wiat language. These names have existed long before the violent colonization of this area and attempted erasure of indigenous cultures and knowledge. The Wiat tribe has a lot of wonderful language resources on their website, um, including pronunciation pronunciations of these words, and I encourage you to um, look up some words that are relevant to you by visiting weat.us. November is also Native American Heritage Month, um, and with that in mind, I would like you to consider making a contribution towards the honor tax. The honor tax is a voluntary annual tax paid directly to the Wiat Nation or other indigenous nations by people who are residing in their traditional territories as a way of recognizing and respecting the sovereignty of native nations. You can make a contribution to the Wiat tribe or learn more at honortax.org. Shown on your screen now are the names of the, some of the communities and bodies of water surrounding the Humboldt Bay, Wigi. I am joining you from Jarujiji, Eureka, and I encourage you to share in the chat where you were tuning in from. Um, as you do share in the chat, please toggle that drop down menu um, to everyone rather than just chatting with our hosts and our panelists. That way everyone can see your answer. Um, I'd like to cover some quick Zoom etiquette, um, Zoom housekeeping while we're here. Um, I imagine people are pretty familiar with Zoom by now, but this webinar function is a little bit different than a normal meeting. So up in your top right hand corner, you can control the view um, and you can have the video for the presenter kind of separated out in its own window or you can choose the side by side mode. If you are in side by side mode, you can move that um, bar in between the presenter and the slides to adjust the size of it. Um, throughout the evening, you can use the chat to communicate with other participants and with the hosts and panelists. Um, if you have questions directly for our presenters, please type those into the Q&A. Um, and after each presentation, um, we will have a moment to go through um, some questions with those presenters. At that time, I will be inviting my um, co-host and colleague, Daisy, Daisy Ambries, to join me um, and help ask those questions to our presenters. Also, if that chat box is um, popping up and blocking, you can open that up into its own window and then drag it off the screen to move it out of your way. Okay, so as I mentioned, um, this webinar is being hosted by the Humboldt Coastal Dunes Cooperative. Um, this webinar is also being recorded and will be posted to Friends of the Dunes YouTube channel, um, hopefully by next week. So the Humboldt Coastal Dunes Cooperative facilitates coordinated ecosystem management of coastal dune, coastal dune environments through collaboration among stakeholders. The intention of the cooperative is to implement this mission by coordinating restoration, preservation, education, public outreach, enforcement activities, and the acquisition by appropriate land stewards of unprotected high priority lands. The cooperative intends to achieve these goals by bringing together local tribes, land managers, public agencies, and nonprofit organizations to work together to coordinate resource management and planning for coastal beaches and dunes. Um, some of the partners that are included in the Humboldt Dunes Cooperative are listed below, and this is probably not an inclusive list, um, but these are the logos I had available to me. So these groups, um, amongst others, are involved in this um, collaborative um, Humboldt Coastal Dunes Cooperative. 
Okay, so um, this webinar is also serving as our annual public meeting for the Humboldt Coast Dunes Cooperative. We have a lineup of wonderful presentations. Um, so we'll have uh, short 15 to 20 minute presentations followed by a five minute period for question and answer. Um, so I think we should just go ahead and jump right into it. Um, first up, we have a Western Snowy Plover breeding update for Northern California. Um, with Jenny Hutchinson, who is a U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service biologist. So I would like to go ahead and invite Jenny to join me now and share her presentation. Welcome, Jenny. All right, how's this look? Looks great. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you for everyone who is here and part of the Dunes Cooperative. Thank you for extending the invitation for me to present. Um, I've recently begun working with this species uh, with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and so I don't consider myself an expert quite yet. Um, but thankfully, we have a really strong clover community around here, and they agreed to share some stories and updates with me, and so I'll be reporting those out here. I do serve as the um, species lead for our recovery unit, and I'll talk more about that later, and that means that I um, help organize partner agencies and organizations around the common mission of conserving and recovering the species. And it's just really an honor um, to present about these partnerships uh, that evolve over the years based on funding and staffing. Um, and they include agencies, nonprofit organizations, and independent consulting groups, along with the public. So first I'll talk about some background on the species to catch us all up. Um, and then I'll give a really brief summary of the 2021 breeding season results. And then I'll just tell some mostly fun stories uh, from around the recovery unit. So let's see. The snowy plover, the western snowy plover, um, ranges from central Washington down to Baja, California, Mexico, and was listed as threatened in 1993. Um, specifically, the western Pacific coast population, and that's um, in blue, or this kind of greenish color right along the coast of Washington, Oregon, California, and down through Baja, Mexico. Uh, this is split further into recovery units. And the idea there is to help with conservation planning and tracking of land management. This map shows recovery unit two. That's what I'll be focusing on, and, and that's my area of jurisdiction as well. Um, recovery unit two encompasses three counties, Delnor, Humboldt, and Mendocino, so our local area. And that's about 250 miles of shoreline. So quite a bit of coast to cover. Um, you can see why partnerships are important here with all these beaches to cover and, and learn about. There are multiple beaches that are occupied by Clover and you can see the majority are, the resolution's not great on this map, but you can see the majority are in Humboldt County. Historically, there was also some nesting on the gravel bars of Beale River, but that's not currently happening. And, um, in the recovery unit two, we have a goal uh, to recover the species, so to get it off the endangered species list, of having 250 breeding adults and a productivity goal of one chick per male that pledges, meaning that it makes it at least 28 days in life and is able to fly. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but I wanted to provide those recovery metrics. We have um, lots of surveys that occur throughout the breeding season and some in the winter as well. Those are intended to measure these recovery metrics. We have a lot of banded birds um, due to a lot of efforts from our partners along the entire range of the species and also locally here in recovery unit two. And that's so we can track individuals closely and, and measure recovery each year. A little bit about clover life history. I'm not going to go too in depth here. Um, they breed generally from March to September. They also uh, they tend to nest above the high tide line, so in the softer sand. 
Their life history is, is rather well known and studied compared to some of the other rare species that we work with. Uh, this is a tiny shorebird. It weighs between 1.2 and 2 ounces, so really small. And um, this breeding season, March through September, if you can imagine when you love to go to the beach, that corresponds with higher beach usage. Talk a little bit more about that when I talk about threats to the species. They're pretty cryptic birds, and I'll show a lot of pictures of them later on, and you'll get a sense for that. And their nests are also cryptic. They rely on those crypsis to escape predation um, of both the, the birds and the nests themselves. They occur on generally sparsely vegetated beaches, sometimes river mouths and lagoons, and more rarely salt ponds and gravel bars. And then they tend to overwinter in similar areas in larger flocks. Most birds express some site and mate fidelity, although some individuals choose new partners frequently and sometimes even new locations. This photo here I think is pretty fun. It's a copulation angel and this is the mark left in the sand after uh, individuals have mated and this is identifiable by surveyors. We usually start to see these around mid-February. I like to remember um, Valentine's Day. It helps me remember when Clover breeding season really starts. Here's an example of a couple of nests in that crypsis that I mentioned. Um, you might have remembered from last year's co-op meeting that Jesse Irwin from Bureau of Land Management talked about restoration at South Spit, where oyster shells were repurposed um, to serve as kind of crypsis material so that they could hide their nests better. Um, interestingly enough, nests have been found on top of driftwood and in some seemingly pretty strange places. Um, and then another little tidbit about the species is that the female, the, the parents raise the eggs uh, together. The female incubates during the day and the male incubates at night. So they take turn, turns. And generally that lasts for about 27 days, although we'll hear about some outliers to that. After incubation, the chicks start to hatch, um, and they hatch in the succession of how eggs were laid. They will remain in the nest until all of them have hatched, and um, they can get abandoned at an age this young so that we can track the multiple broods on beaches. Um, after chicks hatch, the males tend the brood, so the females um, leave and they can often start new nests. There have even been females that have initiated up to uh, three successful nests in one breeding season. Uh, males, you can see this male here. This is a fun picture, I think, because you think this plover has eight legs, um, but it's brooding three, three chicks underneath it to keep them warm and safe from predators. And the male will do this for about 28 days, um, once the chicks hatch, they are able to move around and feed within hours, um, which is known as the precocial breeding system. They can travel pretty significant distances away from their nest, sometimes up to four miles, um, and they're, they're tiny little things. So that's a pretty incredible feat. Um, and remember, this goes back, the male taking care of the chicks goes back to male reproductive success being one of the recovery metrics. That's why they're tied to the male. So that's if everything goes as planned. But there are several threats to the species um, that differ across the range. I'm really going to concentrate on the main threats here in Recovery Unit 2. Um, the first one and probably the biggest one is habitat destruction. That um, is kind of a, a term from the Endangered Species Act, but it can translate to um, habitat loss from invasive species like European beach grass, uh, development, and uh, also human disturbance. So human disturbance brings in um, dogs and just traffic on the beaches and increases um, the likelihood that common ravens are present and they're one of the biggest predators of snowy plovers. So their populations have been expanding. There's some research going on locally here um, with banded raven populations. And I'll point out this graphic on the bottom uh, showing um, somebody recreating on the wave slope and uh, these little shorebirds here. 
So given the wide range of the species, you know, throughout the coast, the West Coast, there's complex land ownership boundaries where plovers occur and combined threats. Um, that just makes our partnerships even more important to the conservation and recovery of the species. Here's another example of um, somebody walking on the wave slope. You can see them in the distance and the plovers remain alert, um, but they can stay foraging or tending brood. In this case, it looks like they're foraging. Um, and here's another fun picture of plovers, you know, hiding and also probably staying warm in these hoof prints um, from horses. So just a lot of different examples of sharing the beach. So I'll move into a very brief overview of the 2021 breeding season and then highlight just a few locations and specific birds from across the recovery unit. Um, I couldn't have done this without all the partner organizations and dedicated clover surveyors, so I'll just keep that in mind as I go through. So this is a sneak preview of the 2021 results. We're actually having our range-wide meeting tomorrow morning. So I haven't heard uh, all of the updates from around the recovery unit. Um, but we had a, a pretty great year. Um, we had 143 nests, which is the highest count during surveying history. Um, the second highest was last year with 104 nests. There were 92 banded breeding adults. That's also the highest uh, recorded during surveying history. And the number of chicks hatched at 123 is also the highest. Um, the number of chicks fledged at 43 is a little lower percentage than normal. Average is um, over 50%, somewhere sometimes around 65%. This year it was only 43%. And a lot of that is due to predation of eggs and chicks by ravens. And I think it's important to point out that a lot of our breeding adults, over half, come from other recovery units. So they're hatched there and fly down, make their way to our area, largely Humboldt County, um, from Oregon. And so we have to give credit to other recovery units and the partnerships happening there. This is obviously a data-heavy slide, and we're not going to go get lost. Um, this is something that a partner put together. Um, to illustrate that over the years, which are on the left-hand column, and across sites, which are at the top, the number of nests changed drastically over time. So I'll point out this column of South Spit didn't traditionally have a lot of nesting, and then restoration occurred in the mid-2010s um, and really increased the number of birds using that beach. And then in the top right, you can see these are the gravel bar locations, and we just don't have nesting occurring there anymore. Similarly, what we see increases at 10 Mile and Mad River as well. So I'll move into just some individual stories real quick. And um, first, I want to bring up a collaboration at Tallowa Dunes between the Tallowa Dunes Stewards, California State Parks, Pacific Ecologic and Fish and Wildlife Service. There's combined monitoring efforts, so more coverage in, than in previous years, and the record high of plovers um, at the Lake Earl Breach site this year, 24 total. Um, this area has several challenges to management. Uh, you can see it's a, it's a popular recreation area for folks um, in Crescent City and that live at Pacific Shores. Vehicle usage is common, and there's a crazy mix of land ownership up there. It's also pretty remote, so enforcement is challenging. In this photo, you can see the plovers kind of hunkered down in footprints and a family keeping to the wave slope, um, which doesn't disturb the birds. This photo is an example of a um, symbolic fence or plover protection area put up in good nesting habitat, and you can see the vehicle tracks turned around when they saw that nest. This is experimental up at Tallowa, but there's been good, good success so far. This photo shows some restoration happening on the south side of Tallowa Lagoon, and I'm really excited to continue this collaboration with our partners and see how plovers respond in coming years. I can't um, go through this presentation without mentioning the old man or orange, red, yellow, red, who hatched in 2001 at Eel River Wildlife Area. You may have heard Mark Caldwell speak about him. There's a publication dedicated to him as well. 
He's 20 years old this year, making him the oldest known snowy plover and maybe the oldest known individual for his um, genus, which is 34 different species. He bred for seven years at Clam Beach and then in 2010 transitioned to mostly breeding at Stone Lagoon. He's fledged 21 chicks himself, um, but he's only the second most productive male. The most productive is uh, red, yellow, white, red. He fledged 24 chicks um, and died in 2015. The one story that's not as uplifting is at North Spit. Um, this is an area that has various ownership and vehicle use allowed. The Bureau of Land Management manages this area um, and it's dedicated to allowing off-highway vehicle use. Um, it's had really limited breeding history historically with only three nests documented until this year when 12 nests were initiated there. It's a pretty tough breeding environment with a lot of human and vehicle use and a pretty narrow beach, so not a lot of habitat. There were several chicks fledged this year, um, but there were also significant losses due to crushing of eggs and chicks by vehicles and some predation by ravens. The next slide is slightly graphic. Um, it shows a crushed chick kind of zoomed out, so if you don't want to see it, look away for a moment. Um, but what I find interesting is that um, clovers, their behavior doesn't allow them to move away from a vehicle. If they see it oncoming, they just hunker down, and that doesn't result in good outcomes. Um, so this is a reminder to drive or recreate on the wave slope when you're out on the beach. Another interesting story is Green Yellow Red Red, um, who hatched and fledged in 2012 from the uh, Eel River wildlife area, and her nest had been inundated by the tide, but eventually hatched after a delayed incubation period. Um, she's a descendant of red, yellow, white, red, who, if you remember, is the most successful clover on RU2. Um, and in 2016, incubated a nest for 50 days, so well beyond the average. She mated with orange, red, yellow, red, the old man, um, a couple of times at least. And then in 2019, things got even a little weirder. A visitor near Gold Bluff Beach reported a four egg nest and state park staff went out and confirmed six eggs in a nest. Three are very standard. Three eggs are very standard. Um, so this was unique and confusing. You can tell in this photo though, that three of the eggs are lighter in color and three have kind of a bluish greenish hue and we suspect that she was co-incubating with another female, orange, violet, blue, green. So that's a pretty interesting strategy. Who um, am just, Okay, thanks. Just a couple more places to highlight. Um, down, going down to Mendocino County, um, the Sonoma Mendocino Coast District of the state parks have had some recent successes. Not as many birds are banded down there, so some of the metrics are harder to discern. But we had 19 nests initiated this year, which is the highest recorded total in 20 years, and the first nest at Manchester State Park in 15 years. You can see two fuzzy little chicks here um, being tended by the male in a restored habitat that was previously covered in European beach grass. So those restoration efforts are paying off. And the last story is a fun one of um, pink aqua, orange, blue, who arrived at McCarriture State Park in Mendocino, and upon looking into his band history, um, we learned that his, his nest was originally rescued from a high surf event um, in Santa Barbara, and those eggs were incubated at Santa Barbara Zoo, the chicks were raised in captivity, and um, he's now a year-round resident and breeder in Mendocino County for the past couple years. So I want to again highlight our partnerships um, with the Plover community. I am pretty worried I left someone out, but you can see all of the diverse partnerships and logos here. Um, I highlighted just a couple locations today, but there have been countless restoration and outreach efforts across the recovery unit in the past couple decades. All of that adds up and makes a difference. Um, restoration has been a real boon to the species. Um, 
and they're responding well, but predation remains a limiting factor for nest and fledgling success. I'm happy to entertain some questions if there's time, and uh, my contact information is there on the lower right. Uh, please feel free to contact me to follow up as well. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jenny. Thank you. Um, yeah, great overview. I'm glad it was such a good season for the clovers. Yeah. Um, okay, I'm going to hand it off to Daisy. Yeah, so we have one question from an anonymous attendee. So the question is, do you think the lack of use of gravel bars might be a result of an increased available habitat at restored dune areas? That's a great question. And the folks I've talked to you aren't really sure why plovers stopped using the gravel bars. Um, it's not a common type of habitat for them to use across the range, and it was pretty unique to our area. Um, but I, I think that's a good theory. Difficult to test, though. Um, okay, we have one from Sherman uh, Shapiro. The mixed nest uh, you just showed, explain again. Okay, yeah, absolutely. So <laughs> each individual bird has kind of a unique pattern to its shell. If you have chickens, you might know that they have kind of different colored eggs. And from that picture, we could tell they were two different colors. And so two females were laying eggs in the same nest. When plovers breed together, they make what's called a scrape. So they dig out a little hole um, where they're gonna lay their eggs. And it might be that these two females were scraping in that same location. Uh, this hasn't really been documented to occur widely. So it's a pretty, a pretty weird occurrence. Unfortunately, that nest wasn't successful. I think it's difficult for a tiny bird to incubate six eggs. Um, they're not designed to do that, um, but it was still pretty neat. Yeah, that's that helps. fascinating. <laughs> uh, one more question, anonymous attendee. Um, how common is it for nests to be close to each other? Um, they can be pretty close together, especially in areas with lots of nests. So at South Spit last year, there were something like 76 nests initiated. And so they can be just within meters of each other. Um, I've seen a couple of nests and they tend to be a little farther apart, um, but they can be pretty close together. In other recovery units, clover are intermixed in flocks of least tern, another rare species, and they can be really, really close to those birds as well. I think that's all of the uh, questions for now. Great. Well, thank you. And if anyone wants to follow up afterwards, um, you can find me at Fish and Wildlife Service. We'll have a final annual report posted there in a few weeks as well. Wonderful. Thank you, Jenny. Um, and I'd just like to add, if you think of questions that didn't quite get answered, I believe Jenny's going to stick around to the end, and we have a few minutes at the end of the whole webinar um, to ask questions to any of our presenters. Okay, so our next presentation um, is Exploring the vulner Vulnerability of Humboldt's Coastal Dune Barriers, um, Insights from the Humboldt Coastal Resilience Project. So I'm gonna invite um, Ian Walker, who is a professor of geography at the University of California, Santa Barbara, to join us here. Hello, Ian. Hi, everyone. Um, can you see the presentation okay? Yes, we can. And can you see my mouse cursor on the screen? Yes. Okay, good, because that's kind of my laser pointer in the, the virtual world that we're in. Um, thanks again, Susie, uh, for organizing this. I think it's really important to, to share all the great work that's ongoing in the region. Um, for those of you unfamiliar with me or, or the project that I'm representing today, um, I've been working on the beaches and dunes in Humboldt since about 2014. Um, I'll recognize my co-authors here, Laura Shinsato is a master's student working with me at my former institution, Arizona State, and Andrea Pickard, who many of you know, uh, can be found wandering the beaches, as you can see in this slide here. Um, Andrea and I have been working together for some time on, on everything from coastal erosion monitoring to dune restoration. Um, the project itself 
is uh, a follow-up from a project that was called the Dunes Climate Ready Project. Um, this Humboldt Coastal Resilience Project, or HCRP, builds on those results and was funded by USCC grant and the Ocean Protection Council of California and involves partnership also with the Coastal Conservancy and Sue Corbali is our, our co-investigator and partner there. So it's a large collaborative project. We're reporting on some 35 or so miles of shoreline, so I can relate to Jenny's uh, exploits and challenges here. So a little bit of the background, um, as I mentioned, the HCRP project is funded to do a few things, about seven objectives. I'm going to show them here, but please don't feel like you have to memorize or read uh, all of these. What I'll focus in on tonight is one of the overarching objectives, which is to complete a vulnerability assessment for the shoreline of the Eureka littoral cell. And so the Eureka littoral cell is sort of an offshore entity that determines the wave and tidal and current forcing and sediment supply that develops the barrier that we know as the shoreline, um, basically from Trinidad to Centerville Beach. So this is an area that was understudied prior in terms of our knowledge of sea level rise impacts. Now that said, there have been um, excellent studies and, and planning reports produced for the bays themselves, but our project focuses on the outer barrier. And without that barrier, of course, you wouldn't have the bays um, inside and, and the communities therein. So the goal again is to complete this vulnerability assessment that considers not just geologic or geomorphic parameters, that's sort of my main wheelhouse, but as a, a geographer, we realize that that human environment interaction is important. And that's really what defines exposures and risks and, and vulnerabilities. So what we've done is we've used an established framework developed years ago by the United States Geologic Survey, and we've adapted it to include socioeconomic and cultural factors. And this is something I've done in other projects elsewhere, and it's become really common in the um, IPCC format or approaches to um, estimating vulnerability and adaptive uh, capacity to climate change. So pardon this uh, rather systematic diagram here, but it just lays out the approach that we used. Um, we'd been working in the area, as I mentioned before, um, the HCRP project was funded um, to assess vulnerability in the area. Now, again, I, I use that term kind of loosely, and I don't mean it as a term to make anyone feel defensive. And again, I've, I've conducted these types of projects elsewhere, and that, it's a touchy term for many people. I think the better way to look at it is exposure of exposure to hazards and the risks that result from that. And the term has been used widely to characterize that. So let's just keep that in mind as we go forward. Um, and the, again, the idea here is to take that geography of being on an outer barrier system that is highly dynamic and forced by what's going on in the Eureka littoral cell and break it down and try and understand how it is and why it is exposed in different ways um, to climate change risks like sea level rise, storms, and coastal flooding. Mostly what I'll show tonight are a bunch of maps. Um, so if you like maps, you're in the right place. <laughs> I won't show a lot of data-heavy um, slides, but there's, there's a lot of analysis that goes behind this, um, which I'll get to in a moment. But, so what we're looking at here is the, the study area from Centerville down in the south at what we call Reach 13 up to uh, Little River State Beach, which is reach one. So those numbers that you see in the, the foreshore there are our study reaches. And those were identified based on a variety of different um, factors, including their shoreline change rates. And, and there have been some studies done on historic shoreline changes, either eroding or prograding, um, geomorphology, uh, other land use activities and efforts, and so on. So we broke down the landscape into these units one through 13. Um, you can see them listed on the right-hand map here. So if I talk about some of these reach numbers or the reach names, that's, that's what I'm referring to here. You can see, um, and it, just to talk about the geomorphology a little bit, the entire system itself isn't comprised of what we would, what many people typically think of as a, a barrier system, meaning a strip of sediment and land that kind of separates the ocean from some back land area that is often inundated with water, a lagoon or, or bays. 
Um, but what's common across all of these stretches are sand dunes. And so, you know, this is a dunes co-op meeting, so that's, that's fitting. But these dunes serve a variety of purposes or ecosystem services, um, such as flood protection, specific uh, habitat for endangered and migratory and endemic species, um, recreational value, cultural values, um, groundwater recharge, and so on. And so in studying these, these barrier dune systems, that's the focus, is how is it that these systems provide these services, and how are they or will they be challenged by future uh, sea level rise scenarios? Okay, so the vulnerability assessment approach is, as you see here, I just need to hide my uh, presenter screen so I can see it all. There we go. Uh, what we have are essentially three levels of groupings of variables. In total, we assess 20 variables that we could map and obtain data for across the landscape. Um, and I should mention, too, that the scope of the study is limited to the barrier or the inland extent of dunes, uh, active dunes or relic dunes. So it only goes inland about a, a, a kilometer or so in the, in the, the, the widest sense. So you can see all the variables listed here from top to bottom. We've got a group of physical or geological variables. We've got some biological variables, some natural hazards. And, and so hazards in the socio-cultural are classes that are often omitted in typical or earlier vulnerability assessments. And we feel that those are important because they indicate cultural values, economic values, social values, and other exposures and risks that relate to things that are going to happen or happen um, anyway within the landscape that might be independent of climate change. And in a way, those and the preparedness for things like fire or tsunami tell us a little bit about the adaptive capacity of an area. So we've got these 20 variables um, that are each sort of grouped. And then we go through a, a classification process where we take the values for each of those from the maps, and I'll show you all of these. We add them up to get sort of a physical vulnerability, a biological vulnerability, and so on and so forth. And then we amalgamate that into environmental vulnerabilities and socioeconomic um, vulnerabilities. And then we group those again into an overall uh, comprehensive. So it is much more than the earlier USGS approach. Uh, it's a more broadly geographic and more human environment related approach. So that's why we call it a comprehensive approach. Um, we're working with um, some scenarios. Now I say scenarios because these numbers that you see here in terms of sea level rise, there are different ones depending on which agency you refer to or which scale of study that you refer to. So the sea level rise rate that we're working with here is about 4.61 millimeters per year. So about half a centimeter per year. Um, and future scenarios. Now I won't talk about the future scenarios in this talk in the interest of time, but we have done some simulations of barrier response into the future. And so by adding up and considering all of these 20 variables and different groupings, we're taking what's called a cumulative assessment approach. So we're considering a whole bunch of things and we're working them together to come up with an overall vulnerability assessment. Another busy slide, um, but what you see on the right hand is sort of our decision and analytical workflow or process, if you like, where we collect a whole bunch of data on all these 20 variables we map them, we assess the range of their values and assign vulnerability scores. And some of these are guided by previous vulnerability studies. Um, we then kind of convert those to mapping units that we can compare because not all our data types are of the same format. Sometimes they're points, sometimes they're polygons, sometimes they're gridded or rasters. So there's a lot of just data preparation that happens. And then we start adding up our vulnerability scores and grouping those into the the categories that I showed you before. And what we end up with are some vulnerability rating scores for each of the variables that range from zero to five. So we, we really break it down to simple numbers and then we add up and average those numbers to come up with a vulnerability or a normalized vulnerability score uh, in this equation here. We don't need to worry about the, the nuances of that except we end up with a score from one to 10 once we get to the vulnerability mapping stage, with 10 being the highest and one being the lowest. Whereas the variables themselves, we kind of amalgamate at a, fine, or a, a smaller range, zero to five. 
So what I'll do now is I'll, I'll walk you through each of these uh, first category groupings and then the maps associated with those. And then we'll look at the vulnerability maps that result for each of these. So, and I won't spend a lot of time on the tables themselves because I think the maps are more interesting and more telling. But you can see the variables listed here. And essentially what we have for any value in this matrix of say geomorphology, we have a corresponding score. So obviously if the landscape is dominated by water, whether it be in the harbor or whether it be out in the ocean, it's not very vulnerable to sea level rise. It, it is sea level and it's rise. Whereas once we get into um, upland areas that are quite different in elevation than our tide ranges or a storm or sea level rise scenarios, and that has a low vulnerability score right up to very high areas such as low-lying beaches, flat beaches, salt marshes, and so on, that would be inundated fairly quickly. So again, I won't go through all of these, but you can see some ranges here. These ranges are largely defined by the previous USGS assessment. Um, we may revisit some of these given the ranges that we see occurring in, in Humboldt Bay, but for, for now, for this preliminary work, um, we've, we've basically stuck to these categories. So these are obvious factors that um, combined are largely physical or, or geological variables that control uh, what we call a physical vulnerability or physical exposure. Part of this and another new contribution for this study is trying to tease out the what we call the relative sea level signal. So the ocean is rising, we know this. Um, we know that the regional rate of rise is a little larger than the global rate of rise, and that's not surprising given that the oceans are large bodies of water and we've got uh, river systems flowing into them and differential contributions of those and so on. And so what happens in some areas that are tectonically active where we have earthquakes and crustal movements um, and in other areas where we might have other things like groundwater extraction or sediment compaction, is the Earth's surface is doing its own thing independent of what the ocean is doing. So if you have a situation whereby your land is rising faster than global or regional ocean levels, then the, the shoreline can actually fall, even though globally or regionally sea level is rising. So that brings up this concept of what we call relative sea level change. And quite simply, that's our regional sea level rise rate minus these vertical land motions. So I'll talk a little bit about how we derive these. Um, so this vertical land motion idea, just, just measuring whether the land is going up or down, we can track from satellites. And there's a technology called interferometric synthetic aperture radar, that's your, your word for the day. <laughs> or INSAR, and essentially what it does is with either a single satellite or different types of satellites, um, using a radar signal to identify the elevation of the Earth's surface through time and changes in that through time. And so the work from this was done um, by M. Blackwell, who's uh, currently a PhD student of mine here at um, UC Santa Barbara, for the entire coast of California. And that's the publication you see here. But what we did is improve the resolution of it down to, I believe, 100 meter squares on the surface just for the barrier complex itself to try and refine how it is the Earth is moving relative to the ocean. So what we found is that vertical land motions are variable. And you can see that in the map here. The red areas are sinking and the green areas are emerging. So these Red areas then uh, are experiencing faster rates of relative sea level rise than the areas that are green, meaning that they're sinking while the ocean is rising. And the range of that uh, vertical land motion is about a mi minus a millimeter, so sinking at about 1.2 millimeters to emerging at about four millimeters per year. And when we calculate what that means for relative sea level change, there are some areas that are experiencing about 1.2 times what the regional relative sea level signature is of about 4.6 millimeters per year. So up to 5.8 um, and other areas about 0.91. The key take home, point, take home points here are that um, the tectonic signals and other factors in the landscape are causing sea level to be experienced differently geologically throughout the region. And that needs to be factored into planning. 
and that all areas are experiencing sea level rise. It's just the rate is different because of these different vertical land motions. So how do we use that? There, here, these are just some blow up maps. So pick your favorite locations um, and see, you can see on the scale here, the, the hot colors represent areas that are sinking. And then the warmer to green colors are areas that are emerging. For the most part, the region is emerging, but there are some regions of concern within this. And it, it, in general, the further south you go, the more uh, subsidence or sinking that we see. Five minute so, warning, Ian. Pardon me? Five minute warning. Okay, thanks. So what we see then are these maps here that we then use to work into uh, one of the physical vulnerability factors. Um, these maps just show the various components of vulnerability. So we've got the geomorphic ones. So these are basically derived um, on lands, landform type. We've got our slope values. We've got shoreline erosion and accretion rates. So areas that are growing have more buffering capacity and maintenance of dunes and shorelines that are moving seaward versus those that are eroding. I'll just skip over this quickly and get to the maps in the interest of time. Um, land cover type and habitat types are listed here, and these are ranked from zero to five. And these are a combination of both habitats and agricultural land use, parks and protected areas, and so on and so far. Um, vegetation vulnerability, classified based on whether the area has been restored, making it arguably more resilient versus areas that are dominated by invasive species, which arguably are not as resilient to sea level rise. Snowy plovers and their presence and other endangered and threatened species. Natural hazards, so flooding uh, based on elevation relative to the mean maximum monthly water levels. Um, tsunami inundation. Land use again, as we mentioned before, but what land use type we have there. Population density, so areas that have higher population and higher infrastructure or different types of land use become more socioeconomically exposed and vulnerable. And then infrastructure. So often overlooked in some of these classic vulnerability approaches is the presence of things that can help us deal with the hazards associated with climate variability and change, even though they're not designed for that. So if you are a certain distance within um, a fire hall or a police station, or an airport or the Coast Guard, then that ability for you to attain services for emergencies improves your ability to cope and over the longer term adapt and adjust to coastal flooding and erosion and so on. At least that's the idea. So clearly there are areas given the transportation infrastructure um, that are, are limited in terms of emergency response. Um, and then there are other areas with very critical infrastructure like pipelines and power lines out on the barrier that affect you know, thousands of people in the area. So here's the maps for those. Um, the emergency response, this is based on distance and time to emergency services. And we've got um, the response uh, service time. Sorry, that's the, the time is the center panel here and the proximity to services is the left panel. And then on the right um, roads. So now you notice some of these maps have straight lines across them. We, we did that because um, we want to link what's happening at the shoreline to the infrastructure behind it. Even though the infrastructure might be way far back on the barrier, it still affects your ability to access and service the, the shoreline itself. So in terms of the vulnerability assessment results, I'll just get to the maps here. What we did is basically average up all of these variables in each of these boxes here across these three steps to get combined physical, biological hazards, and so on and so forth, maps of vulnerability, not the variables themselves, which we've just been looking at. So you can see that here in terms of the geologic vulnerability, and these are coarsened to the reach scale, so everything in that reach gets the same value, unlike what we've been looking at. These are the, the range of values in vulnerability. Remember, one is low and 10 is high. So for those of you who know Centerville Beach and that area, um, below the south uh, portion of the Eel River estuary, uh, highly erosive, very low-lying and narrow beaches, so lots of physical vulnerability there. But biologically, that same site, because of 
you know, um, presence or absence of certain species and habitats is not as vulnerable. So you can imagine at, at the reach scale then that the, some of these factors trade off, but it's not that we ignore them. We additively group them up um, in different ways because from a planning perspective, it might be important to know more about hazards uh, in certain areas than let's say uh, another factor in another area. So in terms of socio-cultural vulnerability, and if you recall from the table, this includes um, sites of traditional importance for the WIAT and other historic sites that have included but not mapped. Um, so, you know, there are values there that are reflected in this map. Uh, infrastructure exposures to the pipelines and the power lines on the North Spit, very important. Uh, the environmental groups, so these are the next level two. Environmentally, these are the areas uh, that are red that are more um, exposed and vulnerable. Socioeconomically, however, you can see that some of the areas that aren't physically as vulnerable are socioeconomically more vulnerable. So Manila, Samoa, and the Fairview stretches here pop out in terms of socioeconomic vulnerability. So overall, then, what we have is this uh, preliminary, and I'll, I'll stress that here, assessment of total comprehensive vulnerability. So you can see that um, the northern reaches themselves and the southern have the greatest environmental vulnerabilities. Whereas the North Spit <clears throat> reaches five through eight here have the greatest socioeconomic vulnerabilities. And when you combine those, this the overall assessment so far is showing that reaches five through seven, so Manila, Samoa, and Fairhaven have the highest cumulative vulnerability followed by these other areas. So our next steps will involve sort of rolling this out amongst our team. And when I say team, we have a very big team of collaborators and partner agencies listed here at the top, um, gaining feedback from them. And I expect there'll be an outreach uh, program. That's one of our seven objectives to kind of bring this out to the community as well for feedback and suggestion. And I, I have to acknowledge the, the huge team of people that have helped make this happen. Um, we couldn't have done it <laughs> without uh, with all of these people here. So with that, I'll, I'll stop talking and welcome any questions and uh, I've listed my email here too for follow-ups. Great, thank you, Ian. Yeah, thanks, Ian. There's a lot to unpack there. Yeah, so we have some questions for you and I'll get started. Um, so uh, the first one from someone anonymous, uh, are the dune heights keeping up with land sinking? In other words, is there a net loss of dune height as a protective barrier? Yeah, that's a great question. It's an important question if we think about dunes as sort of a barrier for flooding. Um, we, we have assessed the LIDAR, which is sort of aerial mapping for the area. Dune heights do vary as you go up and down the barrier. Um, we haven't correlated that to vertical land motions yet. So this is one of our next steps is to kind of take the geomorphology and elevation maps and start to compare them to the VLM. Because um, you can imagine if your dunes are, you know, if they remain fixed in height, which they may or may not do, um, there's good evidence to show that dunes, if they maintain their sand supply, will kind of grow landward, maintain themselves and rise with sea level. But there will be some areas where that ability is constrained, either by changes in the sediment budget or by the limited ability for them to migrate landward. But that's definitely something we're looking into is the variations in dune height uh, and elevation generally um, along the barrier. Thank you. Next question. Um, if there are a lot of three plus magnitude earthquakes, say offshore near Petrolia, how would you have to reassess your model? Uh, well, I'm not sure what model we're talking about, but I can talk a little bit about the vertical land motions because it's really important there. So these VLM maps are derived from, let's say, 10, 15 or so years of satellite observations of an area. So they're, in geologic time, that's a, a snapshot. Um, and what we do is derive kind of an average rate from that. But what we've seen in some of the data is that you know it's not just a line that has a, a slope to it that you get the rate from. There's actually variability on that. One of the signals we've seen in some areas is a seasonal effect of water 
that, you know, you can imagine in the winter when there's lots of precipitation, the soils fill up and the sediments can expand and that causes a bit of vertical lift. And then as the winter comes, that decreases with evapotranspiration or maybe there's irrigation happening. And so that signal we see, and there's no reason to think that we wouldn't see other tectonic signals like um, sort of a monthly to annual scale earthquake signal or what we call small slip events. And you would see that as sort of a jigsaw effect where the land sinks a little bit and then it rises again and it sinks a little bit. And indeed, that's going to be the focus of M's, um, some of their PhD work is to try and tease out that because it's not as simple as just providing a rate. You know, that rate is variable through time and as you've seen in the maps through space. So we are aware of the earthquake signals. Um, I don't think we would change any models because the vulnerability really doesn't matter. It's, it's more that we have a, a good signal for relative sea level that we can use to put against the regional sea level, if that makes sense. Yeah, thanks, Ian. I think that's the rest of the questions. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Ian. Um, and for those that are interested in learning more about this project, I believe over the next year, we're really going to be doing a lot more outreach um, and stakeholder engagement on these um, vulnerability assessment um, results coming up soon. Okay, so next up on our agenda, we have the Collaborative Landscape Level Conservation for Humboldt Bay and Dunes with Mike Sipra, Executive Director of Friends of the Dunes. I'll invite Mike to join me here. Hi, Mike. All right. Hi, how you doing? Good. Yeah. All right. And um, yeah, I just wanted to compliment Ian and Jenny on really excellent presentations. Um, go ahead and share my screen here. Okay, so um, yeah, what I'm I'm going to go through in this presentation is is uh, I'm going to talk about a successful um, project of the Samoa Dunes and Wetlands Conservation Area, update everybody here on that project, um, and then uh, expand the frame a little bit and talk about opportunities for uh, larger landscape scale conservation in the Humboldt Bay area. Okay, so uh, I do want to take a, a moment and acknowledge that all of these areas that we're talking about today are ancestral Wiat lands, they're unceded lands of, of Wiat people, um, and I think it's a, an important uh, context for all of this. The, the Wiat people have stewarded these lands from time immemorial. The, the reason that we have such an amazing landscape here um, in Humboldt Bay is because of that stewardship. And these lands were taken from uh, we have people. Uh, they were dispossessed of these lands through genocide. And I, I think that's an important context for talking about conservation. Uh, I think those of us who are working in conservation um, not only need to acknowledge it uh, verbally, but, but I think take some action um, and up to and including uh, land return to to uh, the Wiyot tribe or, or other Wiyot people. And I, I think um, that's something I would, I would challenge the conservation community to, to do is, is to, to view the Wiyot tribe as a conservation or potential conservation landowner. So that's a, a good transition to this sort of partnership that helped protect the Samoa Dunes and Wetlands Conservation Area. Um, over on the left there, you see the three funding partners, the, California Natural Resources Agency's EEMP program, the California State Coastal Conservancy, who uh, did a tremendous job behind the scenes putting together the, the funding for this, um, the State of, of California's Wildlife Conservation Board. Um, and then you have some of the project partners here, including the Wiat Tribe, um, the, the Bureau of Land Management, Friends of the Dunes, who we took on the interim land ownership or land management we're the current landowners, but not forever. Uh, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, um, Mike Van Haddam in, in particular, really instrumental in, in pushing for this conservation project. And, and the Humboldt Bay Harbor District um, did an excellent job in, in sort of 
uh, being the the pivot point on on the transaction. Um, I want to call out right now the two partners here at the Weah Tribe and the Bureau of Land Management. Um, they are are likely going to be the permanent uh, landowners uh, and land managers of different portions of the Samoa Dunes and Wetlands Conservation Area. So where are we talking about? It's right here. Um, so this is coming across the Samoa Bridge, past Tuluat, and this is the, the land that's which is in the Samoa Dunes and Wetlands Conservation Area. If you haven't been out there, there's a whole network of trails. It's a really remarkable landscape. Um, I'll bring you down to eye level in just a minute, but if you haven't been out there, Friends of the Dunes does lead monthly tours, um, and we have one this Saturday. If you're interested, you should contact us. Um, and it's sort of your, your invitation and your passport to, to getting out on the land. One thing you'll notice here uh, there are some lands on the east side of Highway 255, some lands on the west side of Highway 255. Um, and you'll also notice uh, that this land, even from above, you can tell it's profoundly forested. Um, this now uh, means that we have about 1,700 acres of contiguous protected uh, coastal dunes that are managed for habitat conservation, and for public access. So let's get down to eye level, just above the forest there. You can see this really dense forest. It's mixed shore pine um, and Sitka spruce with lots of other species intermixed, pockets of wetlands throughout. And here's what it looks like when you get underneath that canopy cover, uh, remarkable landscape. Um, you have these, these Douglas firs and coastal dune forests that are just dripping with leather ferns, grand firs, um, and um, more and more people are getting out to see it. And if you have not, uh, again, I would I would just invite you to to come on out with us. Um, it's a really special place. Um, intermixed in this, this is an ethnobotanically really significant area for we are people. Um, and and part of this project has been inviting uh, we are people to the land. Um, we did a program with we are youth this summer. Uh, collecting huckleberries. Um, there are huckleberries uh, throughout, really mature huckleberries throughout the, the property, and that is an ethnobotanically really significant plant to we up people, um, as well as the spruce, the spruce root was, was used. And you can see again that, that shore pine, Sitka spruce forest, this is the furthest southern extent of that co-dominant forest type in the world. Um, so it's, it's right on the edge of its range. It's really expansive. And you can see that it's not just forest. It stretches from the beach, this property, into the four dunes. This is kind of the wetland deflation plain here, these broad parabolic dunes, and going back to the forest. And with that variety of intact habitats, you have a great number of different species that are protected um, and that have room to roam and, and live. And we have seen a lot of these guys out here with the rains. The um, rough skin newts, you'll hear the tree frogs, and a pair of nesting ospreys um, come back to the property this year, which is fantastic. Uh, silver bees, several silver bee colonies in the dunes. Gray fox, you'll see the gray fox scat all over the place. And we did have some plovers that were attempted to set up a nest on, on the beach in front of Samoa Dunes and Wetlands this year. So this is habitat. It's a, an ecological treasure. Um, it's uh, you've got uh, 81 acres of wetland and 139 acres of that uh, coniferous forest. So really wonderful habitat for uh, threatened and endangered species as well, including the, uh, the Menzies wallflower, which has extensive populations, um, and uh, the, the beach leia as well. And these will come up in, in the spring. Uh, the Menzies wallflower, going back, um, you'll see these just popping up like little bright yellow flags um, in early March. So the purpose of this conservation project um, was the protection of natural cultural resources um, for people to study this um, public access. Um, and we've had a lot more people coming back to the, the property and restoration opportunities. Now, Friends of the Dunes has not pursued any um, uh, invasive species removal, we would need a coastal development permit to do that. And we 
um, we feel like we can transfer this land more quickly to the Bureau of Land Management um, and we have tribe, then we can accomplish a, a coastal development permit. But we have done some restoration on the property. Um, it was given to us or it was sold to, to the to Friends of the Dunes in a state where it needed some cleanup. Um, we have now clean, working with partners, and that's Mike Van Haddam on the ATV there. Um, we have now removed more than 5,000 pounds of trash off of the Samoa Dunes and Wetlands Conservation Area. And that's in about a year. We took uh, ownership of this on October 15, 2020. So in a year, more than 5,000 pounds of trash. And we've had help from others as well. This is a different kind of horsepower. This is the backcountry horsemen uh, of Northern California unit Redwood Riders, um, or Redwood Unit Wilderness Riders, They're, that's the name. Um, and they came on, on out and actually packed out trash on mules um, from more difficult to reach places. So again, partnerships are key and have been key to us managing this property. Um, and it's pretty pristine at this point. It's really beautiful out there. There are opportunities, again, you can see some ice, ice plant creeping in. There are opportunities in the future for for invasive species removal. Um, and all of this area that I'm showing you here is a land that's gonna to go to the BLM, the Bureau of Land Management for Conservation Land Ownership and Management. Uh, lots of tra existing trails, opportunities for recreation. This is a birding tour that was led out there. And right now, uh, if you head it out, um, these days the, the mushroom season has been fantastic. And there are lots of mushroom enthusiasts um, um, who are going out to to learn, study, um, and collect. And collection for personal use is has been allowed on this property. Um, again, the parabolic dunes leading into the forest, um, lots of fantastic forest habitat. And these are the, the areas on the east side of Highway 255 that are culturally significant to, um, to Wea people. And we've learned this through conversation with the Wea tribe. And so we're on a pathway to transfer these portions of the land to the Weah tribe for conservation ownership. And that's a, a view of the property it includes some tidelands. And look, this is looking back towards uh, Humboldt Bay and towards Tulua over here. So that takes me sort of to a transition point. We're, we're looking at Humboldt Bay now from this property. This is a microcosm. This is a, a multi-party um, conservation uh, acquisition and management project. Um, and it only works with all of the partners engaged and involved and helping out. And so it's got us at Friends of the Dunes thinking about what that would look like on a larger scale. And um, I wanna be clear that this next portion that I'm presenting is, is not, is, is presented uh, solely as Friends of the Dunes idea, that this is not, something that's endorsed by any of the other partners in the uh, Humboldt Dunes uh, Cooperative. And I, I wanna be really, really clear about that because that, that wouldn't really be appropriate for them to do. This is something that's coming from Friends of the Dunes. So just to clarify that. Um, so we're looking once again at ancestral we lands and that is part of the reason why this is, is so special. And here are some of the lands that are protected now. and what what those of us who are friends of the dunes are, are thinking is that what if we brought all of these things together under, under one inspiring land management designation um, and thus is born the idea of the Wigi National Monument. Wigi is, is the Wiat word for Humboldt Bay and the, the region around Humboldt Bay. Um, we have worked uh, by, by we, I mean, different agencies and partners have worked over the last 40 years to protect these areas and sort of piece this together over time with support from a consistent partner in the Coastal Conservancy. Uh, we have to shout them out on this. Um, but what would it look like if we brought these things together um, and provided additional resources for managing them? So this possible potential and proposed Wiggy Humboldt Bay and Dunes National Monument would provide opportunities for, for cooperative management. Um, and we know that this works. We know it works because it's been done over and over here in Humboldt Bay, we work well together. Um, and it would have, it would allow us as a group to have this sort of coordinated response to the, the challenges that all of these lands faced. 
right? We, we talked on, touched on it today with Ian's excellent presentation. Uh, sea level rise, all of these lands are going to be facing that. Uh, climate change, non-native invasive species. These are all the threats to, to these really special places. And this would allow for a coordinated response. Um, and probably to be able to leverage more resources, maybe more federal resources for, for managing these special places. And I think there's a, there's a side benefit, uh, potentially uh, ecotourism opportunities for, for the communities and the economies of, of Humboldt Bay. So we're putting this out there. We're, we're working with partners, um, including the Weyot tribe on this. Um, and I think there are lots of opportunities for us to work over the, the next couple of years. There's a, a political moment right now um, where we can potentially uh, create a new Wiggy Humble Bay and Dunes National Monument. So with that, zooming out to the landscape scale uh, over Malel there and looking back to Humble Bay, uh, I'm, I'm opening it up to, uh, to questions, to comments, and to ideas. Wonderful, thanks, Mike. Um, and actually, I'm gonna pass it off to Daisy for the question, but you might wanna re-share your screen for your answer. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to be working on, on this big project. Yeah, so um, let's get started on some questions. Uh, first one, what is a parabolic dune? Great question. So a parabolic dune, and I think Susie was right there. I wanna, I'm gonna share my screen again. Okay, these are parabolic dunes, and and um, they're so called because they are shaped like a parabola, and they're shaped by the wind. You can you notice that they line up like this in the shape of the prevailing winds. So it's it's a wind driven or aeolian form um, landform, and it's probably caused by in in the past. There was a naturally occurring blowout at some point in the four dunes, and it pushes these, these tongues of sand back into the dunes. It's a naturally occurring feature of healthy dunes, naturally uh, moving system, a naturally dynamic system. Um, so it's a fancy way of saying these sort of broad, open dunes that are shaped like a parabola. Any other questions? Yeah, next question. When is the BLM taking over Samoa Dunes? That's a great question. I wish I knew the exact answer to that. There, there are lots of different things that have to happen within their lands office. Um, and I'd say the BLM has been an, a, an excellent and responsive partner and they're working through those different issues. Um, with the exchange of the title of land to the federal government, there are lots of different pieces to put into place. So we're working through that with their, with their lands office um, right now, writing a legal description for the property um, because again, it's gonna be separated out um, between those, those two different landowners. So we're working on legal descriptions, potentially surveying, and we may have to do a lot line adjustment of the property through Humble County. So a lot of technical details of, uh, but it's, it's hard for me to know exactly. I would say um, it's realistic that this will happen in 2022. Okay, okay. next question. Would the WIA be free to manage those lands that will, tr that will transfer to them as they see, or would they need to be a uh, continued coordination with a dune co-op? Well, uh, there are gonna be a couple of restrictions on the land itself. Um, and, and that's because all of us bought it. So the state of California purchased this property, used money from different bond measures to purchase this property. Um, and so the state of California would like to, to have the original purpose of the land of conservation, land conservation um, as, as part of the title of the, the property. So we're working through that as well. And, and I was really clear when I went to the Weyot Tribal Council to talk about this possibility 
that there would be restrictions on development. Like you can't you can't build a whole a row of houses on on these wetlands and these protected areas. There are going to be some restrictions. And and what Ted Hernandez said to me, he's the the tribal chair, and um, he said he said Mike, we don't we don't want to build on our sacred sites. This is a sacred site. Um, so I, I think that's really telling. And I, again, I, I do think it's important that we we approach and work with the Weah tribe as a sovereign. They're a sovereign nation, They're not like a typical stakeholder. And I think I think we need to be seeing the Weah tribe as a conservation landowner. Thanks, Mike. Um, another question from so would all the individual owners still own their pieces? Um, but, but would it just have the overlay and funding of a national monument? That's an awesome question. So absolutely, uh, this is the, the goal of this is not to take anyone's land away. I think the landowners are doing a good job of managing for conservation. So everyone within this would still get to, to keep their land and their autonomy, but it would simply provide co-management or cooperative management opportunities and leveraging additional federal resources in order to, to meet the challenges that we collectively face. That's a, that's a really great and incisive question that gets to the core of this proposal. Uh, so I, I really appreciate it. Um, we, the intent here is not to, to take this out of any individual agency or private landowners um, autonomous control. Okay. Um, with the National Monument designation, what areas have been used as an inspiration slash examples for management? Well, I mean, I think one that's that's pretty inspiring um, is Bears Ears National Monument. Um, that there was a lot of, I think, there's a lot of indigenous leadership that helped in the creation of Bears Ears, and it was pretty inspiring. Um, just this last month when President Biden reinstated Bears Ears and in fact even expanded it a little bit. So I think having those opportunities for uh, tribal input literally written into the pro presidential proclamation, um, I think guarantees a more uh, inclusive uh, form of management. And, and I think that that's, that's one that, that um, I would look to I think I think that there are lots of different national monuments over time that we now they're, they're now national parks. A lot of I mean, Grand Canyon was originally created as a national monument um, and um, Joshua Tree, Death Valley, those places were originally created as national monuments. And and they're now the, the fabric of sort of our conservation landscape. And we take these places for granted, but we shouldn't. It takes work and effort and, and people caring in order to advocate for these, these really special places. And I would argue that, that our dunes here and the conservation lands around Humboldt Bay are nationally significant and, and we should be speaking up for them as well. I, I think um, if, if folks have been out to Lanthier Dunes, then you can sort of see what it would look like if we put 40 years of investment into a place, 40 years of love, that's what we're, we're all kind of aspiring to, right? So we can sort of write what this future is gonna look like. And I think we're at a pretty pivotal moment. Uh, we're facing things like uh, sea level rise, it's, it's happening. And I think this is a really, really special moment. And, and I would ask that if, if folks are interested in, in joining us, Friends of the Dunes, to, to advocate for this, um, I would just put that out there that we're we're really open to building those partnerships. Well, I got the snap after that. That's, <laughs> that's a, a beautiful, beautiful response. Um, and I think this is our last question. Um, is there anyone looking for artifacts? Uh, art artifacts. Your art so. Yeah. <laughs> so. You know, I think I think that it's I think that it's important to be I think uh, re res respectful of the fact that these are special places that we're 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 not um, 
we're not digging in these spots. We're not going out and looking for, for things. I think it's really important that we, uh, and, and at Friends of the Dens, we have deliberately not put on our public maps uh, those lands on the east side of Highway 255. I know I, know I showed today approximate locations, but I, I do think it's really important that people are respectful of that, that we're not going out looking for those things that, you know, the, the tribes do have um, uh, tribal historic preservation officers and and if any things are discovered um, then we have a you know on our our properties we have an inadvertent discovery plan which we would immediately alert the the tribes um, and and talk with them but but no I, I don't think that I don't think that we're we're not definitely not approaching it that way and and I would I would urge other people not to either. Yeah. Um, we have some more questions flowing in. How can individuals support this idea at this time? Call our representatives or maybe donate money. That's a good way to help. Well, we are a nonprofit, so I, I would always say that we're we're welcoming, uh, you know, new members, supporters, um, and I think I think in the future there will be key moments where we're going to need um, we're going to need those folks. To to step forward, maybe maybe contact in mass a, a particular elected representative. Right now, we're all the folks that we've talked with, our elected officials so far, have been very supportive. Um, so I don't think it needs that push right now from from people um, calling representatives' offices. We may in the future. So if you're interested in in being sort of on our email list. Um, you could contact us at uh, info at friends of the dunes dot work and um, and we can put you on our email list and, and we will have some activist alerts probably later on in the campaign. So if you want to lend your voice to this, um, we'd welcome that. Um, and we, of course, we would always welcome uh, financial support. Uh, I, I would be remiss as an executive director of a nonprofit to, to not close with that. Amazing. Thank you, Mike. Um, and I just want to reiterate to folks um, on this meeting that if you haven't been out to Samoa Dunes and Wetlands Conservation Area, you definitely need to go out there if you've been to Lanphier and Malal Dunes and been really impressed with those sites. Um, I would, I, this property is really, really special and I think it's important for you to get out there and the forest itself is just incredibly impressive. So um, every third Saturday of the month, Friends of the Dunes is offering walks out at those sites. Um, all right, so it, I would also like to add if you have any follow-up questions for any of our other presenters, this is your last chance to add those. Um, so thank you everyone. Thanks to all of our presenters. Um, we did end up a little bit Friends of the Dunes heavy this evening. Um, Daisy helped me fill in because my original co-host um, from U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service wasn't feeling super well today. So hope you feel better, Laurel. Um, and um, this is actually a meeting of the Humboldt Coastal Dunes Cooperative, um, our annual public meeting, um, which typically happens in November. So keep an eye out for another one of these types of presentations. Um, taking place next year. Um, and in the meantime, if you want any more information about um, the Humboldt Coastal Dunes Cooperative and what we work on, there is an email address that you can email and it's humdunescoop at gmail.com. Um, and I can go ahead and type that in the chat um, as soon as I'm done speaking here. Um, so thanks everyone for being here. We are recording the session. It's going to be up on YouTube um, hopefully next week. Um, and that is all I have for this evening. So thank you so much for all of our presenters. It was, it was such a great um, whirlwind of information and really appreciate you being here.